This is Professor Ariel Ortiz Lagarde streaming live from the International Bariatric Club Studios at the International Institute of Metabolic Medicine in Baja, Mexico. The theme of today's IBC Oxford University Hot Topics and Surgery exclusive event is Management of Leak After Ruin Y Gastric Bypass and will feature experts from the United States, India, Egypt, Brazil, Mexico. We would like to thank our partners Zoom Video Communications, YouTube and Facebook based in California. Also, Laparoscopic Surge, based in Tunisia, and Bariatric News, based in the United Kingdom, for setting up and promoting this regularly scheduled online academic series. We would also like to thank our platinum sponsors, Medtronic, Ethicon Endosurgery, Easy Surge Medical, Lexington Medical, Fulbright Medical, Reach Surgical, David Medical, Mindray, Panther Healthcare, our gold sponsors, Blue Sail Surgical, Fit For Me, Arthrex, Stryker, Advanced Medical Solutions, Liquid Band Fixate, Bariatric Solutions, our silver sponsors, W.L. Gore, USGI Medical, our bronze sponsors, Intuitive Surgical, Boringer Laboratories, Baxter, Apollo Endosurgery. This is the 70th webinar of the IBC Oxford Academic Series that has over 3 million unique downloads and is streaming live to millions of viewers from over 200 countries and territories through the IBC website, ibcclub.org, the IBC YouTube channel, via Facebook Live to the IBC Facebook page, IBC Instagram, and the IBC Twitter feed and LinkedIn. This event is organized by Mr. Harris Kwaja, consultant, bariatric surgeon, co-founder of the IBC and director of IBC Global Education based at Chelsea and Westminster Hospital, Imperial College London, and Christchurch. Oxford University. This event will be chaired by Professor Daina Telem from the United States and Professor Pradeep Chaubi from India and will be moderated by Dr. Omar Ganem from the United States and Professor Luis Gustavo de Cuadros from Brazil. Professor Daina Telem is Professor of Surgery, Interim Section Chief of General Surgery, Voice Chair for Quality and Patient Safety, and Director of the Michigan Women's Surgical Collaborative Department of Surgery, University of Michigan in the United States. Also, SAGES and Foundation for Surgical Fellowship Board of Governors, leadership positions in American Society of Metabolic and Bariatric Surgeons and American College of Surgeons as well as the American Hernia Society. Professor Pradeep Chaubi is Padmashri awarded by the President of India, Chairman Max Institute of Minimal Access and Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery, New Delhi, India, and Honorary Laparoscopic Surgeon to the President of India, Surgeon to His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and President of IFSU 2012-2013. I will now pass it on to Professor Dana Telem to introduce our moderators. I apologize. Good morning. Good morning. Good evening, or good afternoon to um, everybody, where wherever you are. I appreciate the invitation to be here. We have two moderators today. Our first is uh, Dr. Omar Ghanem. Um, Dr. Omar Ghanem is joining us from Mayo Clinic. He is a leader in bariatric surgery. He completed his training and residency at Union Memorial Hospital. He was a fellow in minimally invasive surgery, a program in Rochester at Mayo. He currently has many awards and honors from several institutions, including SAGES and a Physician Recognition Award. And he is a lead across many bariatric societies, including the ASMVS uh, Foundation. So Dr. Ghanem, would you like to say hi to everybody? Thank you so much, Dana, for the introduction, and uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, it's an honor to be here, and uh, hopefully it's going to be a great session with all the talks that are uh, going to be presented. Thank you. I'm, I apologize, I'm having some issues with my internet. Dr. Chauvi, would you uh, introduce our, our next um, our next uh, moderator, my, my sincere. Yeah, sure, good evening, everybody. And I will be introducing the second moderator. We have uh, Professor Luis Gustavo from Brazil. He's a, a consultant gastroenterologist. Uh, 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 in the Portuguese I can help you find a place when I know your location Brazil. in security and privacy settings. 
Choose the Privacy tab. Under Location Services, check Enable Location Services and Siri and Dictation. Uh, it's here to me to be here. I hope to help you in uh, the scope of questions. Thank you. So uh, I think uh, we can go ahead with our first lecture. Is it OK now? I will introduce the first speaker. Yes, absolutely. We can hear you, Professor Chow. Yeah, OK. So uh, now I think and I will introduce to uh, Professor Shanu Kotari from USA. Is the immediate past president of ASMBS, the Jean and H. Harlan Stone Chair of Surgery and Professor of Surgery, University of South Carolina School of Medicine, Greensville, USA, and the first vice president, the Fellowship Council, USA. To uh, welcome um, Shantu, Shanu, and uh, he will be talking about the acute leak from jejunal jejunal and astomosis after RYGB. All yours, Shanu. Thank you so much for that introduction, Dr. Chauvin. Are you able to uh, see my screen? Yeah, we can. All right. All right, these are my disclosures none of which should have anything to do with this particular talk. My other disclosure is, uh, although I'm a big fan of the Ruin Y gastric bypass, I've never had a leak personally at the Dejuno J. Genostomy yet in my career, um, but I've had just about every other complication of the Dejuno J. Genostomy that one can imagine. Um, and so my time spent uh, on this talk is going to be um, applying my 20 some years of general surgery principles uh, around the leak, uh, as well as a review of the literature. I think it's important to talk about the different techniques of the jejuno jejunosomy and the implications that this could have on outcomes. I have, um, uh, this is a, a picture of, of one of mine on how I perform it, which is through the unidirectional stapling um, down both common enterotomies and then a stapler firing uh, in the same direction. Um, uh, again, uh, a pretty straightforward way of doing it, but what is well known about this technique is that there is the risk of the narrowing uh, when you come across that common channel in that parallel staple fashion. Uh, so there are others who have come up with the bi-directional stapling technique, uh, but still closing it uh, in a parallel fashion to the anastomosis. And then there is the, the so-called tri-staple technique, uh, very well illustrated uh, in this chapter uh, by uh, senior author Adrian Dan, where again, the anerotomies are placed in such a fashion uh, proximal that you can fire both directions, but then close the common channel uh, 90 degrees to the anastomosis, leaving it widely patulous and patent. Um, each one of these brings their own unique advantages and disadvantages. Um, I don't perform this particular technique, although I know it's very common. My concern about this is I think the jejuno jejunosomy tends to dilate over years. And I think this particular type of anastomosis may give it a head start and or uh, predispose it to intussusception, which uh, in, in its most extreme form uh, can present uh, with a compromised blood supply and a leak as well. I think about uh, the etiology of this type of a leak at the jejuno jejunostomy, and it could be technical. And by technical, meaning uh, just poorly constructed. Uh, if you are suturing uh, the common channels closed, uh, another one would be if there's a mismatch between the uh, tissue thickness and the choice of stapler height in the cartridge. Uh, could be a, a factor that could lead to leak as well from a technical standpoint. We all know that tension on any anastomosis uh, can put that at risk, uh, which is why, of course, we worry about it more at the gastrojejunostomy than the jejuno jejunostomy. Poor blood supply can certainly be a contributing factor, particularly for those of us who divide the mesentery, 
to try and increase length and decrease tension when it comes to the gastrojejunostomy. Um, and for those who uh, don't do the omega loop technique, but construct the jejunojejunostomy first by dividing that mesentery, it's always important to know that you would rather have the roux side uh, have a compromised blood supply because uh, you can always cut that tip off before construction of the gastrojejunostomy. But if the, you have compromised those tertiary arcades to the jejunojejunostomy and you've already constructed it, now you have a partially ischemic uh, uh, at-risk anastomosis, which would, uh, may need resected and make for a very long day that time in the OR or tragically a few days later uh, if it presents with a leak. And then of course, distal obstruction. Um, and I've seen this on occasion. Uh, this can actually uh, typically occur actually from a trochar site hernia uh, downstream that can compromise either the jejunojejunostomy or even the gastrojejunostomy under tension. When we look at the literature on management of the leak, specifically focusing on the jejunojejunostomy, as some of this literature may be reviewed by other speakers spoke, focusing on the, on the gastrojejunostomy, I think it's important to always talk about the day to diagnosis. And here we can see it ranged, uh, even though it's rare, um, to catch one at one to two days is uh, rare, but um, often it can be seen at seven and eight days. Now, I think the question one must ask yourself is, did this really leak on day seven or eight, or did it only become um, clinically detected on day seven or eight by uh, when the patient either represented or when um, uh, the surgeon uh, made the diagnosis. Again, I think there is, uh, you could make an argument that it's uh, happened earlier, uh, but only manifested clinically a little bit later. And we'll see that theme throughout the rest of the literature. Again, a nice article looking at technical factors around uh, this particular topic uh, by senior uh, author uh, Bruce Wolf showed again, that as we know, we can't stay focused on all of the areas around the gastro J, which we're gonna hear about, which obviously has, a, has its own uh, morbidity and mortality associated with it. But you can see uh, that there were seven or in this series, uh, almost 16% of the leaks were at the Jejuno J genostomy. And it goes underappreciated and underrecognized, which I think will ultimately results in the de delay in the diagnosis and treatment in this patient. Chenda's group looked at this and tried to make a classification scheme. And you can see again, around the GJ, all the various ways. But again, depending on your, how you choose to construct your uh, jejunojejunostomy, it can either be at the anastomosis or you must always remember that there's the stump as well. So anywhere there is a staple line or an anastomosis, there is a risk of leak. We see this particularly in our patients who opt for a sleep gastrectomy compared to uh, a gastric bypass, uh, many of them say, uh, come in and have been on the internet and studying things and have said, I don't want, I want the sleeve because I don't want the risk of a leak. What they don't understand is, and that's when I inform my patients, they're still at risk of a leak. It's just not at an anastomosis or a hookup of the two types of tissues uh, because anytime there is that long staple line in the case of a sleeve or even in the stump of the uh, blind uh, tip of the biliary pancreatic limb, there is risk of uh, non-healing uh, and leakage. I think it's also important to, to uh, highlight here uh, in this classification scheme that there were three leaks at the jejunojejunostomy, one at the jejunal stump, but the three leaks at that anastomosis, one of those patients died for a 30% mortality. And you can see far less mortality than that of that which we fear seeing the most of the gastrojejunal anastomosis. So again, my theory being is that it's a delay in diagnosis and treatment because we're our blinders on and focusing too much on the gastrojejunal anastomosis on a patient with tachycardia, elevated white blood cell count, um, and perhaps fever that makes us focus on the GJ and forget the other parts of the anatomy. Um, my former fellowship director and mentor, Dr. Eric B. Maria, one of the authors of this landmark paper, as he often jokes, he has the largest leak experience uh, in, the, in the US uh, resulting in this uh, paper, but we did learn a lot uh, by review of it over the years. And we can see that there were um, about half percentage of the time 
the leaks occurred at the jejuno jejunostomy, whether it was an open gastric bypass, laparoscopic, or revisional gastric bypass. All of those still, there were times where there was uh, leakage occurring at, the, at that anastomosis. But I think, again, looking at this, it's important to look at whether it was open or in the case laparoscopic. We'll look at that profound delay in presentation and time to diagnosis for these leaks. Uh, particularly concerning was the four patients who had laparoscopic anastomosis leaks at the jejunostomy. Average presentation was 10 days uh, before that diagnosis was, um, was made. And we can see the profound effects on that with a 40% mortality from a leak at the jejunostomy compared to the gastrojejunostomy, which was only 9%. Again, my personal feeling is that is because of the, the so much focus and emphasis on the fear of the gastrojejunal leak that we are, uh, any imaging test that says that that's negative makes us uh, feel better. What's also important to know is 90% of these patients had an upper GI that was read initially as normal. And we know that these are uh, ultimately a clinical diagnosis. We must use our radiologic imaging as an adjunct, but as I teach all of the residents and fellows, just because they have an imaging test that did not detect a leak, it doesn't mean the patient does not have a leak. It means you simply never radiographically detected the leak. Um, they all have false positives and false negatives associated. So we must ultimately uh, use our clinical acumen to a patient who is clinically deteriorating, but has a normal radiologic study and still strongly think that we need to be re-exploring that patient uh, to look for uh, a reason for the reason for their clinical deterioration. When I reflect back then on this, based on uh, my personal experience in a variety of other surgical situations, I would think um, if the patient presented uh, in an unstable manner, I would uh, resect with a leak at the jejunojejunostomy. I would resect the, the jejunojejunostomy. I would leave it in discontinuity. And I would either consider a G-tube and or J-tube in the, in the common channel, depending on how the patient was doing during the case. Another technique that I have done at times is a gastropexy or jejunopexy. So rather than committing the patient to the feeding tube at that time, uh, I put two stitches in the stomach, excluded stomach in this case. Uh, I bring those up with a suture passer and right before I tie those down through the abdominal wall, I put a clip on those four sutures. Um, what that does is create a landing zone uh, for the uh, ultrasound guided or interventional radiolog radiologically guided uh, G-tube or J-tube can then be placed uh, as they show up quite easily on uh, ultrasound. And so with the uh, four clips, it can make like a little helipad uh, where you can stick a needle, uh, pass your wire, dilate and pass a G-tube or sometimes a, a jejunopexy as well. Uh, that way in a patient who did really well afterwards, you did not commit them to the G-tube or J-tube for six weeks when they really ended up not needing it, but now you have to wait for that tract to mature. If the patient was stable and there was minimal contamination, I would strongly consider oversewing the, the, uh, the, uh, the leak, uh, which has been well described in the literature as well. And if the patient was stable but had significant contamination, then I would consider resection and reconstruction in that situation with a G-tube in the remnant. I think it's important to know that when you resect the jejunojejunostomy, obviously you have three limbs uh, there and have to, that would require two anastomoses. The internal defects get a little creative as you try to close those, uh, um, as I know I have done occasionally on, in the past, again, for obstruction, but not necessarily for leak. In closing briefly, what do we have in terms of prevention of leaks? We know that there's a growing body of evidence around the use of endocyanine uh, uh, green fluorescence or ICG. Um, there's an entire society dedicated to this. It's been described in the use, um, including for the jejunojejunostomy and gastrojejunostomy, and particularly for revisional work. Um, I think uh, our industry partners are trying to put some science behind this because what I consider perfused may not be considered perfused by my colleague. And so therefore there is the opportunity for some objective data around this. 
How this ultimately translates into leak risk, I think is still an area for further study. Um, but I think if you had divided the, the mesentery uh, and suddenly were concerned at any question about be, before you construct the jejunojejunostomy and com commit to it, I think it's a good role there as well. Also, there is a role for um, uh, cyanoacrylate has been studied in an animal model. Uh, can this de increase the burst pressure of the jejunojejunostomy? They used a grading scale also to look at adhesions in the animal model. And in what they noticed was the burst pressure did go up significantly if cyanoacrylate was placed over the anastomosis, um, it could significantly increase the burst pressures required, but at the, at, the, at the risk of much increased adhesions that were formed in the animal model. And I think you can argue is burst pressure typically from an ileus, which is rare, or distal obstruction equally rare, really the reason that these are caused, by, that leaks are occurring at the jejunojejunostomy, or are they technical or ischemic in nature? So do we really need this technology or not? And finally, uh, we know that there's a growing amount of uh, uh, experimentation and uh, going on around the so-called magnemosis, which has made its way into the colorectal world for some, starting to make its way into the small intestine as well, where that which tragically was taking off the market in the US because many children would swallow these magnets um, and get fistulas, now is actually a, uh, a device used to create a control pressure necrosis, where the, the magnets find each other automatically, pressure necrose to one another, leaving no risk of leak, uh, no risk of bleed, and no foreign material present. But you still have to make enterotomies to deploy these magnets. And so where you close those enterotomies, there's still potentially the risk of leak there as well. So in conclusion, leaks at the jejunojejunostomy, they are rare. They do need a high rate of index suspicion and the delay in diagnosis is what can lead to serious morbidity and mortality. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, um, Professor Shanu. Uh, I have, uh, first of all, I think uh, I must appreciate the way you presented it, it's extremely, uh, useful uh, and uh, there there's one point which you said about the uh, port hernia i i greatly appreciate that because i had one case where because we close all the ports but you know like you feel confident that you have closed the port but the port might have opened um, the sutures might have given way so we had just short of leak because the patient had obstruction and we possibly reached a uh, little late, I would say, but uh, just before the leak started. So that point is very important because we all feel that JJ leak is uh, uh, quite um, uh, rare, but uh, we should keep it in mind. Second point uh, uh, is again an observation and possibly I uh, my agreement uh, because we have a high volume center. Uh, our training and teaching is that please do not use any investigating modality when you suspect a leak. Tachycardia, the pressure is going down. Don't waste whatever, however efficient the uh, uh, um, facility may be. It may take a couple of hours when you shift the patient and you give. And somehow I am not in favor of giving gastrographin because it's a highly uh, irritant uh, chemical. So if it leaks, instead of producing, it really produces a very severe peritonitis. Right. So I think these are the two observations and my compliments for your presentation. Thank you for that. And it's funny, now that you mentioned your own clinical case about closing the ports, I don't routinely close my port sites. Um, um, but the one, the one time where I knew there was a lot of torque and I looked at it on the gastric bypass and it had made, instead of the circular hole, you know, it had made the ellipse and it was bigger than I was concerned about. So I actually sutured it closed. That's the time I got my, it was through that exact same trocar that I closed, that I got my port site uh, obstruction uh, that put the patient at risk. And so uh, just one more thing, just like you don't hang your head on a radiologic test that says my, my patient is fine, just because you've closed a port site doesn't mean the patient isn't at risk of a, of a port site hernia and couldn't clinically manifest with a problem from that as I know I have personally experienced.
Andy, thank you so much for that presentation. I always learn a lot, even now, whenever I, I see you speak, and I appreciated your technical aspects and going through sort of all the different types of anastomoses and, and pros and cons. Um, I think it's interesting, you know, when we think about how patients fare after this, because it's probably one of two things. Leaks are rare, so there's a delay in diagnosis because we have bias and assume that most people are fine because it's a rare event. And then the second portion is management, right? So people get sick because we delay management, but people also get sick and bad things happen because of how we manage the leak in the operating room. And I can tell you, um, after giving this year's oral boards, there's a lot of very interesting thoughts on management within that first 24 to 48 hour critical period, particularly when there's a lot of inflammation. So I have sort of two questions for you. One, um, you know, kind of, can you talk to us about intraoperative leak assessment? And is that the reasons why leaks are rare? Because I can tell you from my own personal experience, I'll intraoperatively leak test a million sleeves and never see anything, but one in 20 bypasses, I see some bubbles and I oversew it and, you know, I feel okay from there. And then two, you know, your range kind of um, went from leaving in discontinuity to sewing it, but sort of for perhaps persons here who don't have as much familiarity, you know, is there a role for just wide drainage and kind of when do we, you know, consider wide drainage and just kind of getting out of dodge, you know, versus kind of doing some of those other scaled uh, um, opportunities? Great, great questions, um, Dr. Chalam. Thank you. Um, I would think um, first is around provocative testing, which is a talk in and of itself. And maybe some of the other speakers, particularly around the gastrointestinal anastomosis may speak on that. And it ranges from, you know, use of, believe it, ICG is now being used, bubble testing, um, um, as well as methylene blue have all been described. Of course, it's easily available because it's at the gastrointestinal anastomosis. And so those are those of us who live in the provocative testing camp, that's easy to do. The jejunal jejunostomy is obviously more technically challenging if you wanted to sort of test your anastomosis, if you will, because you almost feel like you'd be making an extra enterotomy to introduce either and, and, and stress test it, you know. But I guess if there was one that you were concerned about, you could do that. Um, I hate to say something about one of my uh, fellows, but he recently created an interoperative uh, injury I've never seen before where he passed the point through the the stapler through the back wall on the mesenteric side. So I had to take down the mesentery, see that hole, close it up. And then I was thinking, could I bubble test this? And I was almost tempted to make another, you know, enterotomy and pass the scope in and bubble test this unique injury to make myself, fortunately the patient did well. I didn't do that, but I think that in unique situations, we could consider that kind of provocative testing. Why local drainage is interesting because I think we, we go to it more and we'll hear what the speakers say around the gastrointestinal anastomosis because there's not a lot of tissue left to reconstruct at that point um, per se. I don't know how often I would use it. If a patient presented late with a delayed contained abscess, I would think about percutaneous drainage, which is in essence wide local drainage, or I should say um, focus drainage. Um, that may turn into a fistula perhaps, I don't know, unless it's sealed off on its own. Otherwise, I, I think if I was there and whether it was laparoscopic and open and I saw a hole, I would be, I, I'd be tempted to, to go ahead and try and repair that, thinking it was maybe technical. The one with the GJ is, well, it didn't heal the first time, so why is my stitches going to help in that inflamed tissue the second time around? I think maybe downstream, less tension, uh, less risk of that. I would certainly perhaps lay a drain at the jejunal jejunostomy after that repair, though, as well. Thank you, Chanel. Um, great, great talk as always. And um, I, I want to uh, reiterate also and um, repeat what uh, Professor Shabi and Professor Talam um, mentioned uh, regarding displaying all the methods and techniques that uh, about performing a JJ. I do staple the JJ and close the common enterotomy. Um, all have advantages and disadvantages. And if you ask anyone, uh, they would we are all biased to our technique and why it works and why it doesn't. Um, there are some things uh, with the JJ, it does, there is a learning curve in the JJ. So uh, I tell my fellow that the JJ is where you're gonna get issues when you start uh, working. And I reflect from my experience because 
uh, obstructions. I think Nen Wen uh, published on that early on that obstructions uh, in the first uh, 60 or 70 JJs that, that are performed are way higher at a higher rate than later because there is a learning curve to it. When it comes to leak, uh, I've had I've never had an issue on the GJ knock on wood, but I've had an issue on the JJ, which is uh, the base stitch that I put on the opposite side away from me between the BP limb and the common channel, just to uh, at the crotch of the staple line that pulled through and through uh, on post of day four, and uh, the patient had very heavy mesentery, a bypass in a patient with a BMI above seventy, so. Um, uh, that that was an issue. It did reflect as a port site infection. And the port site infection, another thing I teach my fellows, that the port site infection early on is a reflection of an abdominal catastrophe. It's just sealed against the abdominal wall. And uh, when I went back on, on that patient and had a look, it's like when the, the stitch pulled and then it sealed, and it gave me the idea of just doing a, a, a jujinal patch on the opposite side, and that's how I repaired it. Uh, but again, I mean, uh, there is because there is bile, because there is a high bile flow, because it's a, already a anastomosis prone to obstruction. So the management around the JJ is sometimes harder than the management of a GJ leak because one, we're more familiar of how to manage GJ leaks. There is the availability of stents, pigtails. When it comes to the JJ, almost always, I would say the management is operative, except in the condition that you mentioned, where it's already just a abscess around the anastomosis and you end up draining it. Uh, while I've seen it being done, I always worry in a very thick abdominal wall with the kind of microbes in the small intestine uh, how that infection in the abdominal wall may, uh, if there is any leakage around the drain, uh, there is a, always a possibility of a neck fash or something similar. Again, because of how thick the abdominal wall is and because of how uh, low of a reserve our patients uh, and, the, and the, our bariatric patients have. Uh, my question is for you. Uh, you didn't mention staples, like what kind of staples do you use or you prefer for your uh, widthwise, for your uh, JJ? And uh, when you are, we always talk about in the sleeve or the bypass or doing the pouch, we are um, uh, choosing between leak and bleeding. Uh, when you are stapling in a JJ, we never talk about that, probably because the JJ is uh, the jejunum, the a thinner wall. But what if it's a revisional case? Would you change anything of how you construct your JJ? Would you still do a the same stapling irrespective of how the jejunum looks like? Yeah, great, great question, Dr. Ghanem. Um, uh, on uh, elective cases, tradi traditional bowel, um, I use a, a linear stapler, the, the standard stapler fired by hand with a tan load uh, with no buttress material um, on it. Um, and uh, but to your point, when I'm you know, on call and doing bowel resections in the night. Um, and I try to just replicate my same anastomosis um, in the night, but the bowel's thicker. That's when I suddenly realized closing that common channel with the stapler doesn't look as good. It doesn't make me feel as comfortable. And right before I fire it, I look at it. If I don't like it, it doesn't look, it just looks like it's crushing the tissue because it's a deminus. Then I will uh, close the common channel uh, by suture uh, uh, in your technique. So I do think, which is again, another topic and we have to move on. We don't have interest in time, which is moving towards smart staplers and things like this that can help guide you on tissue thickness. Cause you know, 25 years ago when I started this, you didn't know you picked the wrong staple height until you fired it. And you either broke the stapler, you know, or had mess form staples and things like that. We, we made tremendous uh, uh, strides in technology now where before you fire, we're starting to get some sense of, is this the right load or not for that tissues. And so look forward to seeing, hopefully that'll translate into better outcomes around the world uh, in, the, in the upcoming years as well. Thank you so much uh, for your answer. So we're gonna move to um, uh, introduce uh, Dr. Ala Abbas. Dr. Ala Abbas is uh, joining us from Egypt. He's a professor of uh, surgery. Uh, and head of bariatric surgery at Ain Shams University, Cairo, Egypt. He's also the president of the Egyptian Society of Bariatric Surgeons. 
He is joining us uh, for a talk uh, on leaks from gastrojejunal anastomosis and laparoscopic wound wine gastric bypass, etiology and management. Thank you, Dr. Abbas, and please. Uh, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, my dear friend, Harris Hawaja, for uh, organizing this uh, very interesting meeting. And thank all the uh, sharing uh, colleagues. Uh, the construction of the talks that is starting with the gastroenterostomy and then going to the surgical management of gastroenterostomy and uh, ending up with the endoscopic management, it helps a lot with my presentation because uh, I have to co consider that uh, the rest of the two speakers will uh, are going to cover uh, uh, part of uh, uh, the story. Uh, <clears throat> Let's move on. I'm going to share my screen. These are my the, the topic I have been assigned to to talk about the leak for the gastrojunal astomosis in the and Y, gastric bypass, etiology, and management. I have no financial disclosure related to this subject, and this is my case mix uh, as if so uh, instructs. Uh, it's a mix between the Rouen Y, the SADS, the OAGB, the sleeve gastrectomy, and some endoscopic uh, cases, mainly gastric balloons. I'm going to cover why are we talking about the gastrogenostum leak and how do you feel the responsibility to all this, the etiology as uh, how it's a guide to our prevention, the management, whether the early diagnosis, the minimal invasive management, the role of endoscopic, and the surgical uh, management with its, its indications, and the multidisciplinary idea of management also, and the take home message. <clears throat> so why we are concerned about the uh, gastrojejunal and stomosis leak, when in fact it, its incidence is less than chest infection, DVTs, pulmonary embolism, and cardiac events, which are also more fatal. Uh, probably because we feel a responsibility. This is a surgical complication, which we have to, as surgeon, to uh, make our maximum effort to avoid it and to have to, we are responsible to try to avoid it. We are responsible to diagnose it early and we are responsible for properly managing it. So preoperatively, how can we uh, find that in etiology? The age and the BMI are important factor in the studies showed by the literature as the incidence of the uh, gastrogenostomy is higher in certain situations, also with patients with chronic liver disease, chronic kidney disease, uh, patients with autoimmune disease, and uh, necessitating, necessitating medications which interfere with the healing process of the anastomosis, like steroids and immune suppressants and, uh, and similar uh, important drugs. This is a publication in surgery in, 19, uh, in 2015, and they addressed this and they found out that the incidence of leak is higher in population who are older than 48 years old and who have a BMI of more than 48 also. So these are factors to be considered towards the preoperative uh, uh, etiology of the choice of our patients. We have to make a special care towards the patients who have these uh, chronic uh, conditions on these uh, dangerous medications and who have these age and BMI uh, situations. Intraoperatively, the etiology can always be a, a technical problem using staplers, as already we talked about uh, elegantly uh, by my colleague, uh, Dr. Tari, about using staplers, which height of stapler we are going to use, which sutures uh, technique, single layer or double layer, circular stapler or linear stapler, we're going to close the stapler uh, hole with stapler or sutures. <clears throat> Some use fiber and sealants to minimize the, the leak. Some use reinforcement, which again is mainly to minimize the bleeding from the gastrogenostomy, but it, is, it may well have some uh, role into uh, minimizing the leak. Uh, the golden rules of general surgery is that the stomosis should be tension free, and here it's more dangerous than the uh, general stomosis where the loops can very easily come together. But if you have a, a small pouch or a micro pouch and you're trying to get the uh, ruling up to this pouch in, a, in a, another in a, a super obese male with a very thick mesentery, then tension can be a problem 
into such an osmosis and also the vascularity of the two ends, as my uh, colleague also uh, Dr. Sean, uh, talked about, uh, when we move the raw limb by cutting its mesentery, we may interfere with the vascularity of the anastomosis. Another important technical point is the twist of the anastomosis. The gastrogenosomy should be lying in, in a, a proper, uh, properly directed uh, way because uh, axial twists can actually cause technical pressure or uh, uh, mechanical uh, problems with the anastomosis that can end up into a delayed presentation of liquid, which can take one week or 10 days. Etiology intraoperative, we also have to think about testing uh, intraoperatively to minimize, to, 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 to early diagnose uh, the, the problem intraoperatively, whether by bubbles or air, by methylene blue, by ICG, if you have a problem with uh, vascularity, especially in revisional cases, when you've done a lot of dissection into previously devascularized tissues, and some role for intraoperative endoscopic testing, again, for the uh, anastomosis and the color of the, the mucosa from inside. Also, another intraoperative uh, point which can avoid the, the, the leak is downstairs, uh, downstream obstruction. The usual not necessarily, as Dr. Sean said, uh, cause leaks, but more commonly, it can cause mechanical obstruction by being twisted, by being closing its mesentery, creating an obstruction which backfires at the top at the gastrogenosome, creating the leak due to the distal obstruction with the construction or closures of windows, mesenteric windows, or the dreaded uh, row and O when you miss uh, align your uh, anastomosis and you, you make a complete circle rather than a rolling. And all this accumulates into experience, which is the, the surgeon's experience is, is a cornerstone of, of getting this procedure uh, safer and the responsibility of the senior surgeons to transmit their experience of the, over the years to their uh, younger colleagues to make sure that they learn how to do it. That's quite obvious. And it makes a big difference in the uh, statistics of the, we can see in the literature about the uh, experience, the number of cases of, of leaks uh, differs according to centers. Centers who have uh, big load, with big experience, we usually have less incidence of complications. And I personally have an experience visiting uh, Dr. Philip Shower in uh, Cleveland Clinic in 2006. I was already about eight years in my bariatric career, and I was fascinated by the fact that he put uh, in his OR room, the steps of the Rue and Y procedure in, on, in fixed ink on the wall, and he has to tick each step every time, every case, by a circulating nurse to make sure that he's going through all the technical steps. So even experienced surgeons can have problems with their, with their technique due to overconfidence, due to we are, at the end of the day, humans liable to make mistakes or being not that at your best on that day in that case. So we have to make sure that we have to, to make sure that things go right intraoperatively by creating such a, a way to uh, recheck and recheck and recheck our work to make sure that the patient comes out of theater with uh, the least uh, problems. And here is another publication to uh, reemphasize the importance of, of the, uh, using tests for the gastrogenostomy as I said, the most recent uh, ICG for uh, revisional cases. Here, another publication about reinforcement. And up till now, the reinforcement of the stable line by different techniques, whether from wine or synthetic materials, have been proven to be effective in minimizing the bleeding from the gastrogenostomy. But uh, so far, it did not prove to create a difference in the incidence of uh, leakage. There are conflicting reports in that area. Postoperatively, the etiology of leak can be ischemia, which can present four or five days later, ischemic areas, crossing the staple lines, uh, very close uh, staple lines to each other, is even, even worse than crossing staple lines. If you have a strip of very uh, narrow segment of, of tissue between two staple lines, that may well be more ischemic than a uh, crossing of two staple lines. Uh, the tissue healing is especially if the patient has a chronic illness or chronic debilitation, whatever is previous condition, or the tissues are infected. Uh, fistula can develop in the post-operative on the long term, and you can 
uh, find out that the gastrobronchial fistula uh, reports are always, always starting seven to eight months at least after uh, a, a neglected or a miss uh, treated or failed treatment of, of a chronic leak. Uh, here is another publication from a surgeon in 2016, again, talking about the stable line bleeding and uh, how the reinforcement can minimize it. But again, it does not help us too much as regards the point of talking as uh, the leak. Uh, so uh, it's important to diagnose. We move to diagnosis. Uh, we talked about interoperative diagnosis of, of if you have a worry about your anastomosis or your obstruction, you can test it even with endoscopy interoperative to make sure about everything. But early postoperative diagnosis is, is an important issue. And as Dr. Parajib uh, Chaubi mentioned that relying on, on uh, uh, dye studies to diagnose uh, your leaks is probably is too late. Uh, the early diagnosis is always clinical. You have to be very, very diligent in following up your patients in the first one or two days by the hour to make sure that the clinical signs or manifestations of uh, leak, early leak uh, can be picked up because the management will differ totally if you can pick your patients up uh, with the leak quite early. And here is again a, a publication in 2015 showing uh, the difference, uh, the importance of clinical signs, the tachycardia, the, sometimes the fever, uh, the inability to drink, and uh, leukocytosis, uh, rising CRP, all this in the first 48 hours are very important uh, of great significance. And uh, you can always, uh, <clears throat> be diligent rather than being sorry. We can use the post-operative uh, upper GI series studies has been published many times to confirm your leak uh, site, your final leak size, your policy of managing your leak. But I wouldn't consider it the, as diagnosis as much as it is towards the uh, management plan of, of your leak, if the, especially if the patient is stable. And with a comparison of different techniques, the CT leak protocol uh, seems to be the most e effective or the most accurate one rather than the simple uh, dye with a simple radiology or uh, other measures of diagnosing the leak radiologically. If we're going to talk about the management, the earlier is the better. We have to have a very high index of suspicion. You always have to uh, be suspicious if your patient is not doing well. And you have to avoid denial. You cannot say that this patient has been done nicely, this procedure was accurate. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I, have, I don't remember when was my last leak. It was five years ago and so on. And this may patient, this patient has a, a chest infection, his fever due to his chest. Is this patient be, uh, is having uh, other problems. So, these are all uh, very dangerous uh, things. Nobody likes to face his complications and problems. And I think uh, one of the important message of, of this talk is, is that we have to always uh, be suspicious of ourselves before others. Uh, and we have to, when we have any clinical suspicion to go for radiology and even to go for diagnostic laparoscopy to make sure that this patient is right and that the leak problem is either not there or well managed as early as possible. Our management options include many, many invasive, which has been growing and progressive over the, over the last few years in a very strong way. And I'm sure Dr. Manuel Galvao will uh, elaborate on this very uh, elegantly and his endoscopic long experience with managing leaks. Uh, but this has to also include some uh, interventional radiology to, to drain because sepsis has to be trained in the uh, endoscopic stents will not work in a septic situation in a patient with uh, pockets of sepsis. And you have also to remember uh, patient nutrition during the duration of his, his uh, leak management. He has to be well nourished, hopefully better enterically rather than uh, intravenously which is still can be used sometimes. And Dr. Again, Sean showed that the importance of, of even in the general leak, uh, when he's gone in to, to create a gastric uh, feeding tube or a, a, a make 
a landmark for such an intervention if it's needed. Here are some publications of successful management of interabdominal collections and sepsis by percutaneous images, uh, uh, techniques uh, with interventional uh, radiology and followed by uh, uh, some endoscopic uh, stenting. So where surgery uh, goes in this equation, we still have indications for surgery in patients with acute sepsis. We cannot uh, rely on patients with a severe sepsis or unstable patient to go send them for percutaneous drainage and send them for endoscopic stenting. It has to be managed by proper laparoscopic drainage, opening the pockets, washing out this abdomen and making very good drainage to uh, save the patient's life. And the other role of, of surgery is, is a chronic definitive uh, treatment uh, for patients who fail the interventional endoscopic management. For stable patients who had his trial with endoscopic management, as uh, Dr. Galva will say or will present, the probable success rate of the endoscopic stenting will be somewhere between 85 and 90 percent of the cases. But we still have 10 to 15 percent of our patients after the different types of, of on forms of, of stents, whether it's, it's mega stent, whether it's, it's a double big tail stent with some uh, interventional radiological drainage will end up with chronic fistula after many weeks. These fistulas, if they are neglected for many months, they will end, to, end up into, as, a, as uh, we all know, into bronchial fistula, or more complicated situations. So definitive surgery, interventional surgical intervention to treat these fistulae is our responsibility. And during that surgery, we have to also remember that these surgeries are high risk surgeries. This new anesthesia may not work. Then we have to establish enteral feeding during that procedure. It is a French uh, publication about the gastro uh, or the gastric fistula with the bronchus. And, and most of these fistulas are secondary to sleeve, but if you look into these publications, you find that some of them can following gastrogenostomy of the rune. Why also? I'm sure videos from Dr. Omar Ghanem uh, on the YouTube channel of his are, have plenty of esophagogenal uh, reconstruction, gastrogenal structure, gastrogastric reconstruction uh, by reversal. So these are the three optional uh, we have. If the tissues are too bad, we have to resect this proximal stomach and especially the, small, the pouch is very small and ischemic, we end up with doing the esophagogenostomy to reach healthy, viable tissues to, to join together. If the pouch is big and there's a, a potential to do a reversal, then you can join the healthy pouch to the mother's stomach and uh, go back to the normal anatomy. And uh, Dr. Baltazar from Barcelona did a, a fistulogenostomy if the, again, you can refashion the fistulous opening in the gastrogenostomy and make this fistulogenostomy as a reconstruction. So my take home message will include the ideas of better to avoid, especially in your early career, choose your patients, avoid patients on steroids, avoid patients with immune suppressed, chronic liver disease, uh, chronic kidney disease, patient who has, uh, again, a very high BMI or uh, an old age. And maybe an idea in these situations to go for the two-stage procedure doing the sleeve as a first step to minimize the risk, get the BMI down, make sure that the patient's general condition and healing process will be better to manage technically and do the bypass anastomosis as a second step you cannot overestimate the attention to technical details of this very demanding procedure. It's, it's, it's a difference between the sleeve and the rule why you have to pass is, is the technical steps that need to be learned. You have to give it its time and you have to have uh, a program to, to do it right, to minimize this problem. Always be suspicious of yourself when you operate and when you finish, Always be suspicious of your patient if he has any clinical manifestations of doubt. No need to deny it, accept it, work on it. Go for aggressive way of liberal use of diagnostic measures up to diagnostic laparoscopy because diagnosing early will save the life of your patient. You have to tailor your 
management plan. Now we have the endoscopic, we have the surgical, we have the multidisciplinary, you can create a team according to your local center expertise when you can use either this or that or both together. Sometimes we do laparoscopic surgery and endoscopic placement of a stent during that surgery. So the multidisciplinary approach have to be in, uh, used to the maximum in saving your patients and making the decision of your management according up to the minute condition of your patient and don't wait and, and neglect your patients. And uh, finally, best of luck in managing your leaks for the best outcome of your patients. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Abbas. It's a, a very, very informative and very apt presentation. Uh, I would, uh, I have just two brief questions. First is, do you see any role of uh, buttress materials now? Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, say hello to my dear friend, Professor Chawi. We haven't met for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I had the honor to visit your house in Delhi with your nice paintings, and you visit us in Cairo. Uh, it's a very elegant question. The reinforced material have been pushed strongly by the industry to try to uh, find its place. And so far, if we are going to make our uh, decision according to the available evidence base in the literature, we'll find that they are very successful in minimizing the incidence of bleeding from the gastrointestinal, especially if you have a patient with high bleeding tendency from before in your preoperative studies. But it's never been proven to uh, have any uh, strong effect in minimizing the uh, uh, leak problem. So in our situation, in our, our talk today, uh, to minimize the gastrointestinal leak, I don't think that the buttressing material has a role in uh, reducing that. My second question is that uh, with the improving technology in the stapling devices and understanding of stapling, do you see uh, uh, very significant changes in the leak rates, maybe a couple of years back or maybe 10, 15, 20 years back? Possibly uh, what we do is we do a methylene blue test after um, uh, the anastomosis. And what we have observed that in last uh, many years, you know, like the on the table per operative uh, uh, methylene blue leak has dramatically reduced with the new stapling devices. Uh, do you think uh, you have also observed that the uh, leak rates have significantly reduced uh, in last maybe decade or so? I'm sure technology is, is a, a very important element in, in the, the medical practice of, of our era. And the more they provide us with better technology, the more we get our procedures uh, safer to our patients. So with these intelligent measures, they are trying to help us to make the newer staplers we, we are hearing about that they will be able to choose the height of your stapler, not too late as Dr. Sean said, that you, you when you finish stapling, you find that you didn't use a proper stapler. So hopefully the new machines will tell us which is the proper height to, to use before we fire, not after. So technology is a help. But I think the devil is hiding in the technology and uh, it is important to always uh, recognize the human element. Up till now, we, we, we still have to drive our cars in spite of having intelligent cars which can drive itself. <laughs> Yeah. I think it can minimize, but it cannot really uh, delete the importance of the human factor in minimizing this technical issue in OR. It helps. And probably the other thing which is helping us too much now is the number of practice cases all over the world. I think the more you do, the more experience you get, the less chances of problems you run into. And just, just a little uh, emphasis, Thank you for I would question. like to emphasize that uh, uh, the clinical diagnosis of leak is very important. The only way to conclude whether it is leaking or it's not leaking is laparoscopy. And I want, I strongly feel 
that this message should be conveyed for early detection of leaks. And if it is a negative laparoscopy, I think is a is is a good uh, indication that the team is mature enough and very conscious about the possibility. You know, they are suspicious and they are very vigilant team. That's why I insisted to put it in my take home message that you have to liberally use the laparoscopy yes. as a diagnostic tool if you have suspicion, clinical suspicion, and you cannot prove it radiologically. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for such a wonderful and comprehensive talk. Um, I, I loved your conclusion. I always tell our residents and trainees the best way to figure out if you're having a problem is in the operating room, not sitting by the bedside, hemming and hawing and waiting, you know, and then you days and days go by and people just get sick. And, you know, the, I think the negative laparoscopy is a success and, and not a failure because it's, it's attention and it's something that feels wrong, but we need to do. I'm curious because we talk a lot about staples and staple heights and stapling technologies. But I think there are three main ways people do these gastrojejunostomies. Some people do them all hand sewn. Some people do them stapled with, uh, you know, sutured closure of common anatomy, one or two later, and then some use all EA and stapled. And we have that variability of practice right here, even in our own institution. I've actually shied away from using just a stapled anastomosis because I worried about stricturing on, in having some downstream because at least anecdotally and through some of the literature, a little bit higher rates of ulcerations. Whenever I've done provocative leak tests, which I do endoscopically in the operating room, whenever I have little bubbles, it's always from either like, a, you know, the tail end of the closure of the neuronomy, or I was, I was kind of chuckling, Omar, when you said that you had a leak at the at the crotch stitch because, you know, all good intentions. The one time I had bubbling was because I was trying to do a tension relieving stitch and, and, you know, because the tension went. So I guess um, in, in your opinion, sort of, you've had a ton of experience in this. What do you think the single most likely human factor is to, to these leaks kind of downstream are, and there's no best or worst technology, but where have you landed for yourself personally, as you think about that trade-off between safety and efficacy, you know, downstream for these patients? I think the, the problem will always be in the super obese population, men with huge left lobe of the liver, trying to make a tiny pouch for such patient with a short mesentery, fat and thick, which you cannot see where the vessels are. And you, you feel it, you're pulling these tissues together, you feel the tension, you know this is, this is not going to work. So I think this is the most dangerous type of patients that leak. And it is, it's, again, try to avoid it is better. Early in your experience, it's probably take these patients into two stages procedure, get them asleep at the beginning and leave them for one year or so, and then you go back, life much comes much easier. Or send them to another one who's more trained in doing this super obese. Because I think in these situations, in my opinion, having a slightly longer, bigger pouch with a more relaxed, tension-free osmosis, even if the patient's weight loss on the long term is not going to be ideal, is safer than doing a tiny pouch and creating a lot of tension ending up into a, a, a leak. Call me uh, too much no, <laughs> of a I, you know, I'm just conservative thinking... uh, person, but I hate to be in this situation. Right. No, I hear. So when you feel like no matter what you do, there's tension on the anastomosis, what I'm hearing, do you try to create maybe a longer or a bigger pouch um, and so that's one technical trip. And then I think some other technical trips is you could actually free up some of the connections at the hiatus to bring the pouch down a little bit, move some of the, I mean, that's not ideal, but, you know, move some of the things up. And then I think the way it changes my practice is if I'm ever worried, I'll, I don't normally leave drains, but I, I will leave, you know, one or two drains and those ones that have a, have a little bit more tension on the connection that I'm happy with just as a as a fail safe to try to get people not to get sick. Certainly the drains are, are uh, important, but again, sometimes they get 
locked out and they, they are not uh, good enough. But again, the other point is to create a very wide window of momentum in these patients. You have to cut the momentum uh, along the uh, colon so the loop is coming in a free area. You don't have to get the, your loop coming and carrying all the lift, all that weight of that huge momentum up with it. As soon as the patient stands up, this momentum will pull this osmosis down. Congratulations, Dr. Abbas, for your talk. Uh, I, I agree that early detection and early treatment is the key of the, this type of the treatment of this condition. And that endoscopic treatment is help us a lot, and Dr. Gavon will talk about that. Uh, I just have a, a question for you, not about the endoscopic technique exactly, but is there any condition or any situation that you indicate an endoscopy during the, uh, your surgery? And which is that situation that you not feel comfortable to leave your uh, aware without an endoscopy in the intraoperative time? You see, I, I, I've mentioned that I visited Dr. Sh Philip Shower in, in uh, Cleveland. He is doing uh, endoscopy routinely for all his uh, Roux Y gastrogenosomies. And I think this is very wise. Unfortunately, in some of the uh, theaters I do operate in, we don't have the luxury of having the endoscope in, in theater. But I'm sure it, it is important. Out. It, it adds a lot uh, to the security of the anastomosis, making sure that the pouch is not twisted, the anastomosis is lying comfortably. There's no mechanical obstruction. You can do the bubble testing. If you have bleeding on the stable line, higher up, you can see it. So, it adds a lot of advantages and having a your endoscope in theater in room line anastomosis and putting it inside your every anastomosis is a very wise idea. Okay. Thank you. We have a cash question uh, right now or I need to, that's best for the next lecture. Okay, so I'd like to present now our next speaker, Dr. Manuel Galvon. Dr. Manuel Galvon is a professor of surgery and gastroenterology of uh, Aurobindo Medical College in Dar, India. He's the head of bariatric endoscopy services at Mohad Bariatric and Robotic Center, in India. Scientific director of Endovita Institute, Sao Paulo. Director of Innovation at IBC, Dr. Manuel will talk us about endoscopic treatment of leak after U and I gastric bypass. Greetings, I'm Manuel Govoneto, and it's a pleasure and a joy to be among you in the 70th uh, webinar of IBC dedicated to uh, sleep gastrectomy complications, specifically leaks. And let me start my presentation. So uh, it will be the possibility of treating by endoscopy those kinds of complications. This is the team I probably work with in Brazil, also uh, or work with Mohit Mandari in, uh, in India and now in Mexico with Dr. Elias Ortiz and team. That's my disclosures. I offer you to judge if the presentation is going to be commercial or not. And to note, and to clear that bariatric endoscopy is a very mature field in my country, you can see by the importance of the publications on that. And we can uh, really help on different types of procedures, specifically to tell that in all we talk about complications, so we have to state that bariatric surgery is as safe as a left colon, so it's a very safe procedure, but eventually can lead to complications like leaks and leaks in bypass. So most of this presentation is presented uh, in, in is on the a website of American College of Surgery, as you can see, and uh, how those leaks can be. So we are specifically talking about upper leaks on the upper part of the procedure, as you can see here on the right side of the screen, uh, because the uh, lower part is uh, hard as to, to reach by endoscopy to treat any of those complications on that. So in terms of those leaks, you can see here the bypass can be very like discrete and be like disastrous as you can see here. Most of those leaks, they appear early up to one week and they tend to be, uh, be come together with sepsis. So have to be intervened uh, very early 
uh, and otherwise you can have lead common complications like the gastrobronchial fistulas. And you see here leaks or fistulas, there's a lot of different ways to approach that, to uh, describe that. So to us in endoscopy, we treat them like uh, it, almost the same and what matters to us is they're acute and chronic. So in bypass, the first thing to do before calling the endoscopy is control the sepsis. So by laparoscopy, percutaneous laparotomy, stabilize your patient by any cost. And then uh, we can get into that because if you go in an unstable patient, we can help very few on that. Once it's there to say that most of the bypass leaks, they tend to heal because it's a low pressure system, very different from the sleep gastrectomy. And most of those leaks, they tend to become chronic on that. And uh, up to 30 days, uh, one of the very interesting approach you can have is weight, uh, have uh, to uh, take good nutrition in your patient, clinical management, uh, brain gastrostomy, and get some source of uh, nutrition, if possible, enteral nutrition. And the traditional uh, therapeutic endoscopy like clips and glues, those things tends not to work. And pay close attention to keep this pressure environment as a low pressure. So if there are any stenosis, dilate even if it, it's early, you can do that. And uh, if it fails, you can go to the therapeutic endoscopy on that. So dilate first. If it doesn't work or the hole is too big, then we go to another measure that we're going to discuss right now and follow the leak flow as you get these measures. So as states, and we most, lots of people forget about that, dilate first, make it low pressure so it, that it tends to heal. If not, uh, we have, you can see in the screen, uh, quite some uh, possibilities to treat this, those kinds of leaks. And uh, the first, the first comes is the stents, the older one that had used the more, the most. And you can see here in this meta-analysis that if you use endoscopic treatment, 92%, and when you take out all of the, conf the, the confounding factors, it's still 92% of healing when you use endoscopic approach to treat renal you know, gas bypass leaks. And uh, in especially uh, or our center, our centers, and our team is, is used to that, to use the, the, the stents for bariatrics complication. And you can see here that uh, on overall, we can treat uh, the majority of the leaks, 80% uh, with the using of stents. And then if you follow meta-analysis and more studies uh, on the basket, this, this from Sao Paulo University, those guys are very good on uh, judging and evaluating other people's work. So that's the meta-analysis, you see 28 papers. This part is specifically for when by gastric bypass, and you can see very different types of stent that comes with a lot of confounding factors that you analyze that. But anyways, uh, her, uh, 11 studies, 108 patients, and you can see 76% uh, overall success rate when you use any kind of stents to treat that in any kind of those. Most of them were treated acutely, as you can see here, if you put acute and early, you have uh, more than 80% of the patients were treating in that situation. As time passes, the stents tends not to work properly uh, for bariatric leaks. And you can see here that the losango meta-analysis pointing on the same direction, what I say. The Achilles tendon is the stent migration on a third of those. And, uh, and that's what we kept to, to say that in, uh, in 1.2 stents per patient means that some patients will need more than one stent to heal and the dates in the round uh, three to five weeks of stent in places what the meta-analysis points to us. You can see here the meta-analysis on uh, migration around a third of them has this problem. And uh, another meta-analysis, uh, more recent meta-analysis, uh, 2022, saying to us uh, what is uh, leaks and stents. It means that it works, we need to surveil the patients. More prospective randomized studies are needed, but they are very difficult to be to be to be done on that particular area because the the patients are few and comes from different centers. So, anyways, that's where the literature points to. And you can see here classic patients. You can see that the bag is full, as is full of air. And how we do that? 
we use uh, a guide wire. We, we need to use some uh, like landmarks. We use paper clips. You can see here uh, the Zofagaspi junction, the leak site, the Zofagus, eventually even the, the boil. So you pass the stent and then you open the stent by the landmarks you put outside so you can clearly can position well your stent and you can clearly see that this patient has a little bit of stenosis that it was probably the cause of keeping this leak alive then we eat test with contrast to see if it's good so you see here that the bag has no air anymore it has before doesn't have anymore so different types of stents and what which one to use so what's the angel what is the devil uh, if you use the fully covered they're easy to remove the mic but they migrate more if you use the partially covered they're very difficult to remove but they migrate less so it depends on the experience of each service most of the services they use the fully covered stent and then they check out the patient each other week to see if it is in place and there's a lot of uh, methods of stent fixation the chin technique that put uh, put a wire and you fix that on the nostril you can suture directly the stent seems to work you can also use some a big clips, the visco, the padlock, and even you can attempt to use regular clips in the endoclip. They do, those seem really not to work on that. Uh, they seem to work, but there is very few data uh, pointing to that. So, but the description see that it can fix this problem of uh, dislodgement. And uh, also, we can uh, even uh, work in the worst case scenarios uh, on that. So, let's take a look of this case. A patient that present uh, early with aphasia, he couldn't uh, like swallow almost anything. Saliva was coming out, and we have to pass a very slim scope. When you pass the slim scope, what we find is that they have a lot of ischemia, as you can see here. So what to do? Wait that to open or put the stent. So we decide to prophylactically put the stent, as you can see here, the guide wire, and the stent being passed open it and those this patient went very well even after the test you can see here that is water water tight so that's one of the cases and uh what happens when the stent migrates well you have to check the stent most of the times the good news is when the stent migrates the leak is healed as you can see here the stent these patients didn't come to follow up and then it comes uh, four weeks and we find uh, that stent was not there, so it was on the bowel. So you can see here that the leak is already healed. Then we use a pediatric colonoscope. We are able to identify where the stent war was and retrieve it in an endoscopic way. So put inside the scope by the lasso, then you take it out. So as you can clearly see here, there was no more leaks on that. Eventually, some of the patients need surgery, but uh, most of the time you can rescue. And this is a case, the very extreme case, patient had to get reoperation five times and the surgeon declared he had to have more access. So when he gets that, you have a necrosis, no, ischemia of the distal esophagus, and we are in the middle of the cavity now. Unfortunately, the patient have a nasogastric tube, so we could follow that nasogastric tube and put ourselves inside the bowel, as you can see here. And another surprise is not only the distal esophagus looks ischemic, but the bowel uh, looks ischemic as well, as you can clearly see here. So the decision was made in putting a stent to reconnect it. So we use a summary guide wire. Then to that, we put the stent, as you can see here, we open the stent. Patient was an ICU intubated. So we didn't put any nasogastric tube at that time. And we keep the patient for some time there, as you can see here, there was no leak after that. In two weeks, uh, we went there, the patient was much better, and we used the stent fully open now to check how was the bowel. You can see that the bowel is very viable on that. So the patient, after that, we passed the nasogastric tube, the patient was getting better. And you see here, uh, after four weeks, uh, the, the contrast and the CT scan show the stent in place with no leaking no leak into that so you can clearly see the stents the stent up here and after six weeks six weeks in this case we did a, a, let a little bit more we removed the stent as you can clearly see here by endoscopy 
And what is after that? So what we can see, and we have a series of around uh, 20 of those cases, and you can see that clearly there is no signs of leak. Patients was already uh, out of the ICU and was home eating when we removed that. So that's no leak. We thought that maybe we have this residual area, residual leak here, but still we did uh, x-ray and didn't saw any stravasation. So, so good cases to illustrate that. And uh, even we can treat cases so advanced, so severe like this one that has, as you can see here, we're gonna pass through the, this is the pouch, this is the anastomosis, and we go into the limb, it's a, a limitary limb leak. So as we progress our scope, you see here that we end up going outside uh, outside of the patient belly, you can see here our colleagues on the on the field, and look at the scope getting out of the patient belly. So what we ask, we ask our colleagues to surgical colleagues to put their hands there so we can pass to the other side. We pass through the bowl now, and then we again decide to put the stent, and you're going about to see the stent here, but it was not like watertight. So and you can see the light from the abdomen there. So what what the tactics to do that is that we use clips. We did, the suture didn't reach there. The endoscopic suture didn't reach that. So we use uh, the clips to put that in place. And uh, our colleagues outside, they will put uh, a mesh. For sure, we put a nasogastric tube ahead of that. And our colleagues, they you, they were using that kind of mesh that can be used in with sepsis. And they also suture the stent in place. So this patient evolves very well. They have a, a vacuum. Uh, dressing there in the patient went very, very well at home. The other option, especially when you have a huge leak and you have an, an sepsis of that, and it's the EVAC or endovacuum therapy. And you can see here that uh, it starts uh, there in uh, sepsis on the esophagus, uh, sepsis on the, the colon, the rectal. So that it was very, very effective to that. So it's natural to transpose that to bariatric leaks because it's a low, low, uh, low technique, low, low, sorry, low, uh, low, uh, doesn't, doesn't need a lot of technical skills, a lot of technology. It's ready available there. So this is the very first publication on a ruling guy, gastric bypass, and they have very good results and this patient has a sepsis on that. And, uh, so bariatric leaks, there are very few reports on bypass, a little bit more on sleeves. You see one of those is a six patients, 100% closure, but with 23 days uh, of patients in the hospital. So there's a downsize of these techniques. We have few data and, and the patient needs to stay more in the hospital, but it's a low tech and it's readily available. So it's gaining some popularity on that. And even progressing on this new stent that is a vacuum stent, so it put both uh, of those possibilities together. We have to observe when the data comes uh, on those patients in bariatrics. So what to do in terms of direct closing, uh, glues, suturing, clips, irregular clips. So that's a lot of doubt. The series is small. And if the laparoscopic direct closing doesn't work, uh, my personal opinion is that those kinds of things, they doesn't work uh, on, a, on a direct Closer. So the meta-analysis even evaluate this uh, over the scope clip, this big one, the second on the left, and 60% of those resolution compared with 90 plus of the other techniques. So uh, also the pigtails, the internal drainage is so popular, they work so well in the sleep gastrectomy that very few data uh, on the gastric bypass. So I just show you the mainstream of this and we'll finish telling you that we can really help even when the worst case scenario, look at this very old uh, paper of us, 2011, by using the techniques to have up this, this at the time, stand, septotomies and sink, we were able to, uh, to heal the gastrobronchial leaks. Some of them you can see here in bypass, some of them in leaks, so depending how uh, evolved is your center, how specialized is your center on that. So, and, and overall, uh, the endoscopy can really help on treating the leaks after gastric bypass. So thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Are we asking questions? Could I, could I uh, talk something about the Galvon's lecture? Uh, I just like to organize some uh, ideas about the practical, practical aspects about this topic because we have a few time. So uh, Galvon presented us all the concepts and techniques that we can use uh, through endoscopy. But uh, in vacuum actually is, uh, I think is becoming the most popular technique in Brazil. And uh, we have some adaptation about that. And I already say for my colleagues that the vacuum is something more democratic, you know, because all the endoscopists uh, know how to manage a tube and uh, has the possibility to put this tube inside the cavity or inside the stomach, for example. It's very easy to manage uh, uh, to, for the endoscopist, there is to prepare and as it's a low cost procedure, but it's not so comfortable for the patient because patient needs to stay connected in the wall or in the machine vacuum for uh, a long time maybe, but it's a very good option in some situations that you don't have uh, other possibilities or uh, even if you don't have a bariatric endoscopy available at this time. And in a case of patients staying in EC, uh, ICU with oral intubation, a stent is a very good option. You can use early or not. Vacuum therapy, we always need to take out the drain if patient have one. A stent is a very good option. You can use in early or chronic leak also. And the option about partially covered or total, or total cover stent is uh, very personal. But the partially covered stent is a challenge to remove. So the endoscopist need to, to have a lot of experience in this technique. But you can use in all the situations. Not necessary to use the mega stent in, by, in bypass. We generally use uh, esophageal stents. And uh, pigtail is another possibility that Gavon told us, told us. And pigtail actually is, uh, I think, the most comfortable technique for the patient and for the endoscopy because you can put there and you can start the, the, the nutritional the oral uh, food for the patient patient and deliver the patient earlier and always we can uh, use uh, a septotomy septotomy we can perform in a chronic leaks if you have of course a septum and if you have a captain in the side of the septum we can cut all the septum with uh, endoscopy, with uh, a knife, endoscopic knife. And, and then about the time that we can manage this patient using endoscopy, we can manage it, manage it in all the time. If you have a uh, suspect, suspicious, in the first day, the five days after the surgery, in the first week, we can use endoscopy. It doesn't matter the time that you uh, are in after the surgery. Thank you for the summary. I, I think we have some questions from, um, from the social media that we can um, utilize the remaining time to answer if everyone is okay with that. So um, a question uh, that came when uh, Dr. Kothari was uh, uh, presenting, it's about the late leaks in immunocompromised patients. Uh, have you seen any uh, late leaks in immunocompromised patients? If Dr. Kothari is not there, Dr. Abbas, please feel free to. Yes, uh, <clears throat> immunocompromised patients, patients on steroids or immune suppressants, uh, patients with autoimmune disease, they are uh, really should be treated uh, with uh, more co conscious about this, their situation. So you don't give them the, the normal post-operative uh, schedule you do uh, on a patient. This is not the patient that will start uh, oral drinks uh, after six hours and go home after 24 or 48 hours. We usually go back and treat these patients like the uh, old school of open surgeries that they have to stay uh, NPO for five days. We do the contrast study 
on the fifth or the seventh post-operative day, and we start very gradually the oral and the, uh, progression flows after that. Because uh, these patients have the tendency to leak at the seventh or eighth or even tenth post-operative day when when they leak, so you shouldn't trust in the early. You should have to look after them properly and be very diligent with their diagnosis. Also, you may consider technical points in in these patients rather than simple uh, single layer of sutures you can use two layers of sutures you can use uh, the 3o rather than 2o you, you have some technical points of of change we have to change during your procedure to make sure that these patients have uh, a better chances of of healing less chances of leak perfect another question again we still have a minute or two um is about um the use of fibrin blue uh, to prevent leaks, um, uh, Dr. Taram, um, Dr. Chaubi, if if you can comment of the, uh, on that, if you have had any experience with using fibrin blue to prevent leaks, uh, not really. I think uh, I I I don't think it can really help uh, in preventing the leaks because. Uh, it's not going to prevent if the avascular leak, it's going to be there. The avascularity will not increase with glue. I feel that uh, the low pressure is the, the secret of uh, having uh, uh, lesser chances of uh, leaks. And uh, uh, my other this thing was that uh, possibly, um, well, I think uh, to the, our endoscopist friend Galvano, was uh, don't you think that using a foreign body reduces and it slows down the chances of uh, leak collapsing and you know uh, uh, healing sooner with a gastros gastrostomy and doing just nothing and draining it should help. Yeah, I, I don't use fibrin glue because it's not going to address ischemia or tension, which is why I think most of these leaks happen. I use more fibrin glue sometimes along staple lines or edges in persons who are on um, anticoagulants where I need to anticoagulate very quickly. And I realize it might just be voodoo, but it makes it makes me feel a little bit better, you know, to do it. But I, I think it's not it's not a great combatant for the for leak issues. I, I agree with you both. So uh, I'm, I'm going to go back to you. And I think you, the conclusion statement both from uh, Professor Taram and, and Professor Chauvi. Thank you. Professor Talman, please go ahead. Well, I wanted to thank everybody for spending the morning, evening, or day with us, depending on where you are in your time zone and location. I hope this was educational. I know I learned a lot and very much enjoyed uh, seeing friends and colleagues from around uh, the country. And I think it's great to be part of the 70th event and look forward to seeing everybody for number 71. So thank you so much for the to the organizers and to everyone for being here. Yeah, same as here. I think it's a, it's a pleasure meeting uh, all of our friends, which we have not met for a long time. And also to revise and uh, you know, the, you know, your memories get revised with the knowledge and expertise which they have and the suggestions to uh, make it safer surgery for our patients and also uh, uh, give emphasis on the teaching aspects to our younger surgeons. So it has been a wonderful evening and uh, thank you very much uh, Ariel and Harris for giving us all the opportunity. Thank you the moderators and uh, above all, thanks our speakers to bring the salient features of a particular topic and uh, with a very clear cut message. Hope we will have more frequent and more important uh, such meetings in the future, uh, covering a very important but uh, very crucial aspect, which uh, changes the clinical outcome of any surgical procedures. So thank you very much and uh, wish you all a good health and happy times ahead. This has been an IBC Oxford University Hot Topics in Surgery production. I want to thank my co-chair, our moderators, and our distinguished panel of experts for their valuable time and talent today. 
We want to acknowledge all our partners and sponsors as our global collaboration produces safer and better outcomes. To view the complete Hot Topics in Surgery series, subscribe to our IBC YouTube channel and follow us on our social media platforms. Mark your calendars as the third IBC Oxford University Congress is coming up this September 19th through the 21. For more information, go to ibccongress.org. And now let's view another brief episode of IBC's exclusive Spotlight on Industry and today's sponsor from IBC Global. Stay safe and God bless.